I inform the Senate that at 8.30 am today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal will be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Walsh. The Morrison government's failure to address failing wage growth, growing insecurity of work and increasing incidents of wage theft. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask this, the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, first of all, can I congratulate Senator Jess, Jess Walsh uh, for advancing this matter of public importance, because it is indeed a great matter of importance to people right across this country that this government, in its third term, having worn through three prime ministers, has presided over a period in Australian economic history that is absolutely characterised by wage stagnation, by jo growing job insecurity, and what we've come to accept in our parlance is the description of a practice of too many businesses that was, until recent times, called underpayment. On the watch of this government, the scale of underpayment has been so extensive that it's now known as wage theft in the Australian community. So I really sincerely congratulate Senator Walsh for bringing this matter forward because Australians are feeling this pain. They are feeling it intimately every time they try to balance their budget, every time they try to get ahead. People in insecure work reporting to Senate committees that they have no chance of getting a loan for a car, let alone a house, when their work is constantly described as insecure. This government is presiding over a period of separation between hard-working Australians who want to work, who want to work more hours, who just can't get it, and a government that's looking after people whose wealth is rising by the day as the Australian Stock Exchange rises. And, and this was part of the evidence that we received uh, from per capita. Uh, in the inquiry that is currently underway that deals with critical matters with regard to industrial relations. And this is what per capita said in their opening statement. Despite a strong recovery in asset prices and a falling headline unemployment rate towards the end of 2020, the reality is that Australia's economic recovery from the impact of COVID-19 threatens to take the shape of a K rather than a V. That is, some people will do very well having retained their jobs and saved money during the lockdown last year, while others will fall deeper into insecurity and poverty. That's what this government is provide, presiding over, a period of time where it, there is a profound decline in the capacity of Australians to have secure employment have the benefit of sharing in the economic benefit of Australia as a, a very wealthy nation. And I have to say, I was profoundly impacted by the evidence that we received at our hearing just last Friday. A wonderful AIM working in aged care who talked about the struggle of actually trying to make ends meet not being able to spend anything in the local business economy, but having to go to big uh, suppliers of foods. She couldn't support her small businesses because she needs to buy materials in bulk or buy no brand or home brand goods, the very cheapest all of the time, because her work is so reduced and so insecure. She also spoke about the ramifications of this job insecurity in terms of her capacity to do her work ethically. She's a carer, a carer by nature and a carer in her paid work. And her care for the elderly in aged care is critical to their health and wellbeing. 
and she described a situation where her work is now so precarious, based on arguments that no doubt you'll hear from the others on the other side, that allow efficiency for some businesses. That's what it's described as efficiency measures, flexibility measures. Every time someone from the LNP says, we need to give businesses flexibility, workers love flexibility, it belies the reality of what they're delivering. Genuine flexibility in the workplace with small businesses absolutely happens. There are great small business employers. But there are also some pretty dodgy ones out there. And what this government has presided over and is attempting to introduce in, in, in their IR bill is more of an attack on job security. We need job security and flexibility. We can't trade one off against the other. Flexibility can't always be loaded up as an advantage to the powerful and used as a tool of abuse of those who are in insecure work. Yet that's what we're seeing. The matter we're discussing today is a matter of public importance because good businesses that need money to move around in their local economy, good business owners who employ their staff, who know the names of their staff, who know the families of their staff, who genuinely provide flexible, great, secure work, they know that their businesses are hanging on a precipice come the end of March with the withdrawal of JobKeeper. More insecurity, stagnation in wages, and for the worst type of employers, a such a sense of entitlement to take and make profit for themselves that they take the wages of the people they dare to call their employees. They should be more truthful. When you steal someone's wages and they work for nothing for you, or work for too little for you, work for wages that are illegal, that is a form of servitude. It's a form of modern day slavery. And if the government gets its way, we will have worse conditions for Australians. The government's economic agenda reveals their total unwillingness to get wages growing for Australians, their desire to cut working conditions for Australians, and their refusal to legislate to protect Australians from increasing instances of wage theft. Wages in Australia have stagnated under this government. Corporate profits have continued to grow. And the average Australian worker, and that's most of us, they're not getting ahead. They're feeling the pressure. They're feeling the pain. And they're expressing concern. And it's manifesting itself in the data around mental health, or better put, mental ill health. Anxiety, worry, concern, that they can't see a pathway forward to look after themselves and their family under this Liberal National Party government. Inequality in Australia has grown ever larger, and it's come as a result of the design of this government. In the new monstrous IR bill, which I think is aptly called Work Choices 2.0, we've been taking evidence about what that will do. Let me be clear. It's a massive bill called an omnibus bill. It's got loads and loads and loads of um, schedules in it and proposals for change from this government. And buried deep down in the bottom are a couple of half-decent ideas, but even they are not legislative drawn, legislatively drawn in a way that will improve the lot of Australian workers. I've heard no evidence in the three hearings that we've been allowed to have, because the government only allowed three hearings, and Deputy President, you would know the pace at which those hearings have had to advance, with half-hour slots, with people coming forward to want to give testimony not allowed to speak because it's so contained by the government. Not one of those hearings, not one bit of evidence that we've heard, gives me any hope 
that there will be wage growth under this government. In fact, this bill, if passed, looks like it will put downward pressure on wages. One of the key issues that prevents wage theft is proper legislation that acts as a dis disincentive for people to steal the wages from the people into who, uh, with whom they enter into a relationship of, of an employer to an employee. We've seen wage theft at a remarkable scale across this country. Very, very sadly, this government, if it passes this legislation, will reduce the protections that are currently in place for Queensland and Victorian workers. This is a matter of importance to the nation and the truth should be told. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Abetz. Usually in matters of public importance, I'm able to compliment the ALP, at least for rhetoric, if not on facts. But I must say, on this occasion, I can't even compliment the Labor Party on their rhetoric. And clearly, if uh, the Honourable Senator opposite thinks that the, her contribution just then will assist her in her pre-selection battle with her deputy leader in this place, uh, I'm not sure it's going to cut the mustard. But look, let's have a look at what this uh, motion actually says. And there are three parts to it. The Morrison government's failure, let's be correct, alleged failure, to address falling wage growth. First of all, who determines the wages in this country? It is the Labor Party's beloved Fair Work Commission. It is the one that sets the minimum wages in this country. And so if there is a failure in relation to wages and wages growth, it is the system that the Labor Party itself set up in the first place. This is the Labor Party's creation. So what they're basically saying, if they were honest to the Australian people, is that that which they set up has been an abject failure for the workers of Australia. But let's be clear. Good, sound economic management allows for wages growth whilst inflation is kept at bay. And that is exactly what the Howard government was able to achieve in its period of office. There was real wages growth. But for that, you need good, sound economic management over a lengthy period of time. And it would be fair to say that after the ambush of the economy by Labor, after uh, the Howard government was defeated, it took some time to try to get the economy back on track. And we were achieving that when COVID-19 hit. And so what the Labor Party is trying to suggest to the Australian people, and they're smarter than that, they won't accept that sort of empty rhetoric. They know that there are circumstances which mitigate against the Fair Work Commission increasing wages because there has to be that balance between wages and jobs and job creation. The second part of the uh, motion talks about the government's alleged failure in relation to job security. Well, let's be clear. There was a huge spike in unemployment for one reason. We all know it, COVID-19. So let's not try to get cheap political points on the back of a national pandemic. The unemployment rate, thankfully, is coming down, coming down steadily, and what is more, with permanent jobs, with full-time jobs, and that surely should be celebrated. But no, the exact figures to back up that which Labor is asserting in this motion were not presented by the Labor Party in moving this motion. Why? Because there aren't those sort of figures to support the assertion. Indeed, so desperate was the Australian Labor Party in this debate that they had to rely on per capita as somehow providing some credibility to this motion. And then the third limb of the motion talks about increasing incidence of wage theft. Well, excuse me, where was the evidence for that assertion? Completely and utterly absent in the presentation that was made uh, to us. But uh, let's be very clear. Uh, I recall myself 
saying that underpayment, if it is deliberate, is wages theft. And, uh, that is why we as a government have said on numerous occasions that we have zero tolerance when it comes to wage theft. If a business can't run itself without underpaying workers, they should not be in business. But Senator O'Neill, in her contribution, referred us to dodgy businesses that would seek to underpay. Well, I wonder what dodgy businesses might spring to mind who did so in cooperation with a trade union and a trade union leader who now sits in the other place. A trade union leader who used to be in charge of the Australian Workers' Union, Senator Small. Underpaid mushroom uh, workers, cleaners, builders, and we will rem see what happens from the um, Registered Organisations Commission investigation in relation to the union itself. But talk about dodgy, I would have thought that would be one area that the Australian Labor Party would not seek to traverse. But the reason, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the Labor Party refused to present figures to us is that if figures were to be presented, they would be telling us that the Fair Work Ombudsman is taking strong action on behalf of workers. So in 2019-20, over 100, or exactly $123 million was recovered, a record of amount of money for underpaid workers, which is more than five times the money recovered by the agency during Labor's last full year in office. Because we as a government resource the Fair Work Ombudsman to be able to pursue this matter and get wage justice for the workers of Australia. And this momentum is continuing in the first six months of 2021. The Fair Work Ombudsman recovered almost $80 million for over 31,000 employees, filed 37 litigations and entered into 12 enforceable undertakings. These are the facts. These are indicators that we, as a coalition government, are concerned to ensure that a worker who is entitled to appropriate wages receives those appropriate wages. No, the, n none of this funny money dealing that uh, Mr Shorten from the other place engaged in whilst he was uh, uh, Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union. And look, if the majority of the Australian workforce were actually to believe the mantra of the Labor Party, one suspects we would not be in office on this side. But they take a balanced, sensible approach, recognising, one, there is an independent arbiter for our wages in this country, namely the Fair Work Commission, and it does its job. Sometimes workers get more than bosses want, sometimes workers get less than the workers want. And that is the role of an umpire, to try to make a decision which is fair and reasonable in all the circumstances. Because we all know that if wages are set too high, it will cost jobs. And therefore there is that important balance that is required. That is something which the Fair Work Commission seeks to do to the very best of its ability. And that is why we have so many people uh, in employment, gainfully employed and being able to uh, sustain themselves in, in work. But the Australian Labor Party in their submission before us, not a single alternative what Labor would do other than to oppose the bill that is currently before us. And what does that bill seek to do? for the first time ever deal with the issue of, you've guessed it, wages theft, to actually criminalise it. In the years of Labor, under Bob Hawke and Paul, uh, Ms. Mrs Hawke and Keating, and then under Rudd, Gillard Rudd, did the Labor Party ever see it necessary to try to ensure that it could be criminalised in a manner that would dissuade bosses from doing so? No, they didn't do anything. 
Who's it been left up to? Yet again, the coalition to get a fair and balanced workplace. The Australian people have voted previously, and I can reassure them that this is a government committed to fair, balanced workplace relations, ensuring that they have the dignity, the self-esteem, the mental and physical health benefits of employment. They are the things that we want to see. We, on this side, see employment not only as an economic good but an overwhelming social good as well. And that is why you have to have that balance, that sensible balance, and that is where we on this side are very comfortable in looking after both the worker and the employer. Without an employer, there'd be no employees. We need the balance, and that is what we as a government are providing. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Walsh for bringing this matter of public importance to the Senate. Over the last 40 years, Australia has gone from being one of the most egalitarian countries in the Western capitalist world to one of the most severely unequal and one dominated by business interests. Key to the growth of inequality and precarity in Australia has been decades of neoliberal industrial relations policy designed to smash the power of organized labor and reorient workplace organization in favor of maximizing gains from, for employers and giving them more flexibility to hire and fire workers. It's not so much that the Morrison government is trying and failing to address stagnant wages, the dominance of insecure work and the scourge of wage theft. They simply choose not to. They have no intention of winding back the systems that entrench poverty, inequality and precarity for workers to the benefit of corporations and billionaires. In fact, they're doing the opposite. 1.2 million people are locked out of work and then there are others who are locked in poverty on job, seeker, on job keeper. This government's core constituency is big business, they're big donors, and things are going pretty well for them. Before the pandemic, wage growth was stagnant, jobs were increasingly insecure, and wage theft was at epidemic levels. Since COVID reared its head, things have gone even worse. The labor share of national income has fallen from 50% for the first time since 1959, and corporate profits have soared. Wage growth has fallen to record lows and wages have declined in real terms. And as lockdowns have ended and businesses have begun to reopen, the proportion of insecure jobs has exploded. This government has shown no interest um, in genuinely tackling wage theft. The most important and effective wage theft deterrence, such as making sure that wage thieves know they may be caught out and increasing the powers and resourcing of regulators um, to investigate claims and enforce the law don't seem to be on the agenda at all. Forty years of marketization, deregulation, privatization, government outsourcing and good old-fashioned union busting have created an economy designed to funnel wealth upwards and leave workers with the scraps. Suppressed wage growth, the expansion of insecure work and pernicious increasing, increasing wage theft are symptoms of a business-oriented system working precisely for the big end of town. Until this government either undergoes a fundamental shift in its political orientation or is kicked out, nothing will change. They need to be given the boot. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. And then I too thank Senator Walsh for putting forward this MPI because I think it does go to the fundamental failure of this government and it does sum up their terrible record over seven years. And that record is a failure to address wage growth. It is a failure to address the growing insecurity of work. And it is a fail failure to deal with the increasing incidence of wage theft. Uh, and indeed, when you look at their record, it is a sad record after seven years of this LNP government. And I wanted to consider that in detail because I think there is a lot of detail to understand when we're looking at the record of this government over the last seven years when it comes to these issues. But when it comes to wages growth, according to the OECD, 
Uh, and I know Western Australian Liberal senators have a lot of faith in the OECD at the moment. Since elected in 2013, real wages in Australia have declined by 0.7 per cent. So that's their record after seven years in government. For wage growth in 2019, so this was before the pandemic hit, Australia ranked third last out of 35 countries for wage growth. So even in the year before the pandemic hit, the record of this government was still a terrible one. So it has been a miserable seven years for Australian workers and their families, and particularly for those looking to get ahead and build a better future for themselves. And sadly, their record in insecure work is no better. The LNP's record, even pre the pandemic, has seen insecure work skyrocket. And the, the travels I do, which is particularly through regional Queensland, you come across so many people who have been impacted by the use of labour hire in their industry. Uh, it is absolutely rampant at the moment. Uh, and you talk, to, you talk to people who are working side by side, doing the same work, but one worker is earning 30 to 40 per cent less than their permanent counterparts next door. And we exposed some of this during the Senate hearings uh, into the bill put forward by the government as well. So ultimately, the use of labour hire that I've observed through regional Queensland, it is actually being used to also drive down the wages and conditions of all workers. That's the ultimate game of those who want to bring it in. They want to drive down the wages and conditions of all workers. And when it comes to wage theft, we have a federal government that has done nothing for seven years. Uh, Senator Abetz tried to say they have zero tolerance. Uh, what he fails to talk about is what they've done for seven years. They've been in power for seven years. He highlighted some of the recovery they've made. Well, instead of trying to recover money, why don't you try and stop it? That's actually the power of the government. You have the ability to do things to stop this from happening, yet they add none of that and have no record they can point to after seven years, despite so many examples that have come before us, 7-11, uh, uh, which was just an outrageous attack on the workers uh, that were in the employ of that company. And now, as Australians want to look forward uh, and emerge from the pandemic in a stronger position, something to be optimistic about the future, the government offer up more of the same. Their IR, IR changes will undermine the paying conditions of workers. It does little to address the rampant use of labour hire uh, that we've seen that is so prevalent through so many parts of Australia, but particularly through my experiences in regional Queensland. It does nothing to create secure jobs with decent pay. Uh, what could be more important for Australian families at the moment? Uh, to rebuild after being impacted by a pandemic, to have a secure job with decent pay, uh, something that they can actually plan for the future on, Yet this government continues to offer more insecure work uh, and, more, and no changes that are going to lead to a better pay for those Australians. And it can dry, contain, consigns more Australians to more years of the same with more casualisation and insecure work. And their proposals on wage theft are weak when you compare to what some of the state Labor governments have been doing to outlaw uh, wage theft. They've been slow to move despite all the evidence that is being presented, and when they do, it is still weak. So a government with a shocking record, a shocking record when it comes to wage growth, a shocking record when it comes to insecure work, and a shocking record when it comes to wage theft. And after seven years, they are offering no solutions to actually fix up these problems. The best they can do is more of the same. And there's no doubt that the Australian people are looking for an alternative and they deserve so much better on these issues than what their federal government has put up so far. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I'm here on behalf of a government that has taken proactive and decisive measures to help Australians. We're focused on helping the economy grow jobs. And having delivered one and a half million new jobs prior to the onset of the pandemic, under our responsible economic management, 93 per cent of those jobs are already back. We have sought to boost wages for Australians through tax cuts delivered to more than one, uh, sorry, one million businesses in Australia and 11 million hard-working Australians already seeing more money in their pocket as a result of the initiatives that this government has led. We have sought to enhance productivity uh, through measures like the tax carryback and instant asset write-off. But we aren't done yet. 
Mr Acting Deputy President, because we've got before this chamber a suite of sensible, measured and incremental reforms that will seek to provide people with certainty, enable casual workers to convert to full-time employment. Uh, we, we've sought to articulate uh, the, the work that the government is doing with respect to wage theft and enhancing the protections that vulnerable Australians uh, would be protected by. Instead, rather than those reforms already putting more money into the pockets of Australians and rather than those additional protections already being in place, we are being held back by the Labor Party who sit opposite. Our approach to this has been informed by extensive collaboration with both industry employers and unions, but instead we've seen the Labor Party seek to turn workplaces into political backgrounds whilst the Leader of the Opposition is focused only on his tenuous grasp on his job rather than the jobs of those out in the community. The government's already demonstrated that we're willing to work with this chamber and work with the crossbench by removing the section 189 amendment. We've done this because we see five key areas of reform that will assist Australians. But by attempting to block this, Labor is actually standing between Australians and wage growth, Australians and wage theft protection, and Australians and increased, increased job security through a more prosperous economy. Labor's industrial policies were overwhelmingly rejected at the last election under the then leader Bill Shorten, and we're simply seeing this recycled now by the current leader of the opposition. Labor's proposed industry laws reveal who really calls the shots on that side of the chamber, and the only job they seem focused on is that of the leader of the opposition. This government has made it clear that we have zero tolerance for employees being underpaid and makes no exception for any employer who seeks to exploit vulnerable Australians. The government has committed to decisive action with $160 million to the Fair Work Ombudsman, as Senator Rebetz clearly articulated, and has increased the penalties for employers by an up to tenfold increase. So the only thing stopping a tenfold increase in the penalties for employers that do the wrong thing is those opposite. Undertaking reforms to enforce our current and compliance and enforcement regime with the current Act is also part of this contemplated reform. But Labor clearly doesn't believe that those, wages, sorry, those workers who are underpaid need and deserve better, better wage protection, because they've seen them as a necessary sacrifice, throwing them under the bus by, by blocking this bill. They made this blatantly obvious in the past as well, when they advocated to scrap uh, the Australian Building and Construction Commission. They've also uh, uh, carefully ignored the fact that the ABCC has already returned millions of dollars to employees since it was reintroduced by the coalition government in 2016. The Fair Work Ombudsman continues to take decisive action on behalf of workers despite the unprecedented effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. $123 million re-delivered into the, into the pockets of workers, five times more money than that same agency was able to recover under the previous Labor government. The Fair Work Ombudsman has delivered 952 compliance notices, a 250 per cent increase on the same number of compliance notices issued in 2018-19, filed more than double the number of court cases against employers who have done the wrong thing, secured 163 per cent more court-ordered court penalties, issued 603 infringement notices and, and finally, $56.8 million in back payments for workers. But we are not done yet, Mr Acting Deputy President, but we are being held back by the intransigence of those opposite, who clearly, from their track record of opposing the ABCC and indeed the Registered Organ Organisations Commission, oppose not only the rule of law but also shredding uh, the, the absolute iron grip that the union movement has uh, over, over labour relations from their perspective. What proposals have we heard from those opposite? in this chamber tonight that would seek to improve worker uh, entitlements and protections. We've heard nothing, Mr Acting Deputy President. In fact, all we've heard from those opposite is a proposal to take $153 a week from the pockets of casual workers across this country, a tax on businesses uh, and, and, and nothing else. Nothing else. In opposing these changes, 
the Labor Party have further signalled that they do not have any intention to streamline wage recovery. We have seen them uh, with reports suggesting that underpaid employees are merely collateral damage to a broader approach that seeks to em em emphasise uh, that the, the, the Leader of the Opposition uh, holds his job. They have also stood between uh, workers in Australia and a quicker enterprise agreement approval process, where we know that enterprise agreements in this country deliver up to 40 per cent more than award wages into the pockets of Australians. 40 per cent more into the pockets of Australians. And now the Labor Party still oppose that. If that's not wage growth, Mr Acting Deputy President, I don't know what is. But let's talk a little around flexibility that those opposite say is this terrible, terrible premise. The reforms that this government has proposed would allow 30 per cent of the part-time employees in the retail sector and 40 per cent of part-time employees in the accommodation and food services sector to work more hours, work more hours, but with the protections of being permanent employees and with the leave entitlements associated. But no, the Labor Party would rather that those hours go to workers under more flexible arrangements, such as casual employment. So it's the Labor Party that stands between part-time permanent employees being able to work more hours with more protection and, indeed, entrenching casual employment at the heart of the Australian economy. As something that's very close to my heart as the Western Australian representative, we've also sought to create job opportunities with uh, project certainty for mega uh, projects on greenfield sites, allowing eight year or up to eight year uh, agreements to be struck. No, the Labor Party stand between more investment dollars generating more jobs for Western Australians and Australians more broadly, whereas this government, this government is about getting more jobs for more Australians. Stronger conversion rights for casuals is central to the reforms that this government has offered before this chamber. But Labor is saying that I would rather have more casuals remain uh, even if they would prefer permanent employment. The mechanisms that this bill articulates provide a clear and consistent pathway for any casual worker, having served the requisite notice, uh, so the requisite time period, to, to convert that employment to permanent employment. It is a right that this bill confers. So what holds that back? opposition from the Labor Party. So the only side, it seems to me, Mr Acting Deputy President, who is proposing to cut wages, to cut uh, job security and to cost jobs in the Australian economy is in fact the Labor Party. In true Labor fashion, their solution to all problems is simply to raise taxes. And we saw this going into the last election with $387 billion worth of new taxes proposed. We've seen it recently with this $20 billion hit to business uh, or, or a pay cut for casual workers of $153 a week. So, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, if we're serious in this place about putting more money into the pockets of Australian workers, if we're serious about affording Australians the improved job security that comes with a healthy economy, if we're serious about tackling wage theft and getting uh, wage underpayments into the pockets of Australians in a more efficient and streamlined process, then honourable senators in this place will get behind these important reforms and get the job done. That's what the people who's, of Australia who sent us here sent us here to do. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This motion is one of the least self-aware that I've seen out of the Labor Party. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that the median wage has not increased in real terms over the last 30 years, after adjusting for dramatic increases in the cost of housing, healthcare and education. And yet Australia's gross domestic product per capita has increased over that period from $13,600 to $65,400 in real terms, as are all my figures today. Gross domestic product is up by a factor of five, and the wages of everyday Australians have not increased. Where's the money gone? Average wages for Australians at the upper end of the scale have seen an increase of 50 per cent, and at the very top end, the increase is over 100 per cent. 
a graph of our median and average wages over time is untroubled by changes in government. Liberal, National, Labor, Greens, it makes no difference. Workers just keep going backwards. Wages as a share of GDP, gross domestic product, have fallen from $116 billion to $94 billion over 30 years. The share of our gross domestic, gross domestic product being paid to Australian workers is at an all-time low. Yet corporate profits have grown to $120 billion, six times. Globalist economics has crushed the wages of everyday Australians and deposited the spoils from an expanding economy into the pockets of the big end of town in salaries, bonuses and dividends. Globalist free trade agreements have seen more than one million high-paid, skilled manufacturing and heavy industry jobs moved overseas. Labor is a big fan of globalism, voting in favour of every one of these free trade agreements. Recently, the Senate voted for a UN funding bill to direct money into funding economic development in countries with which we have a free trade agreement. This facilitates increases in their productive capacity to take yet more Australian jobs. One nation were the only party to oppose the funding bill. The Labor Party voted in favour, in favour of losing yet more jobs overseas. Now, COVID restrictions have had a role to play as well. The government's COVID restrictions measures have moved consumer spending away from small businesses who employ everyday Australians and moved those jobs to corporate retailers who pay minimum wage. Online growth has gone to Amazon, owned by the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos. Social media are calling the COVID restrictions on businesses a war on capitalism. It's no such thing. Corporate Australia, the biggest crony capitalists, have record sales, record profits, and have paid higher dividends and bonuses. As a result of government COVID restrict coronavirus restrictions and measures, the world's 400 richest people have increased their wealth by $1 trillion. Much of this new wealth is money that was once spent in local communities, in local hardware stores, community supermarkets, butchers and grocers. This was money that held up real wages paid by local businesses to their loyal staff. Now those businesses have been forced to close or to sack workers. So the real outcome from coronavirus measures has been the largest transference of wealth from small business to foreign-owned or, or controlled corporations in Australian history. We expect this sort of thing from the globalist Liberal Party and their sell-out sidekicks and nationals. Yet this has been brought to you by Labor in Queensland, Labor in Western Australia and Labor in Victoria. Almost every government measure during the COVID period has been waved through the Senate by the Labor Party, working in conjunction with the Liberals and Nationals. Labor don't get to complain now. They should have seen this coming. The only thing that was not in this profligate spending was a permanent increase in job seeker. The constant pressure from one nation in this place and directly with the government across many years has today had a result. One Nation will continue to stand up for everyday Australians. The destruction of wages and entitlements of Australian workers has many other causes. At the heart of the problem is supply and demand for workers. At the same time that Australia is sending jobs overseas, we're importing workers. Over the last 30 years, Australia has added 10 million new Australians. While many of these do not go into the productive economy, the bottom line is simple. We're importing workers for jobs that have already been exported to lower cost destinations, especially China. There are more workers than jobs, and that can only have the effect of reducing wages. Labor defend Australia's high immigration rate and suggest one nation are racist for wanting a reduction in the rate of arrivals. The use of the word racist means they have no argument to counter us. All one nation are doing is to stand up for everyday Australians who will never get a decent pay rise as long as the government keeps bringing in more new arrivals than there are jobs. The Rudd Labor government and the Gillard Rudd Labor Greens government increased permanent migration from 160,000 in 2007 to 205,000 in 2013. Labor cannot pretend to care about workers when it was Labor that initiated the largest spike in arrivals in the last 30 years. The other issue around the stagnation on, on real wages is foreign temporary workers. The Senate inquiry into temporary work visas found temporary migrant workers experienced widespread wage theft and gross violations of Australian minimum work standards, including failure to pay even minimum wages, long work hours and lack of health and safety training, leading to workplace injuries. Temporary work visas holders 
are being exploited to drive down wages and conditions. Indeed, Bill Shorten, as minister, set the record for temporary work visas in this country, a record that Labor still holds. And I don't hear Labor complaining about this. This may be because their beloved free trade agreement facilitate foreign workers. The Indonesian free trade agreement, section 12.9, removes labour market testing and allows additional contract workers across 400 skilled occupations. It allows for 4,000 temporary working holiday maker visas per year who are highly exploited because they're, they're deported if they lose their job. Wage theft is not entirely restricted to vulnerable foreign workers, although it does account for most of the cases. The problem of falling real wages, job insecurity and wages theft that Senator Walsh talk, mentions in this motion results from Labor Party policies. One nation is accused of wanting to wind the clock back. Well, on this issue, we do want to wind the clock back, back to when workers got a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. We need to, put, need to start putting Australia and Australians first, back to when workers settled here, became Australian Senator citizens Roberts, and contributed to the future of our marvellous country. expired. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it used to be said that in life there was only two constants, death and taxes. But under the Morrison government, the Australian worker must deal with three constraints and three constants, falling wages, insecure work and wage theft. These three crises of the Australian labour market are not just holding Australian workers, they are also holding the Australian economy back. Wage growth has reached its slowest pace since the Depression of the 1930s. The most recent September quarter, wages grew as little as 0.1 per cent. Things have become so desperate that the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Philip Lowe, has begun calling it a crisis in wage growth, calling on workers to start demanding pay rises from their employers. Even before the pandemic, the pace of insecure work in Australia has been rising, and since COVID-19, the pace of insecure work has accelerated rapidly. For example, 60 per cent of all new wage jobs created since May last year were casual jobs. This is the biggest increase in casual employment in Australia's history. Three quarters of all new jobs were part-time in nature, and insecure work such as our own account contracts and gig work, dominated the growth in jobs considered self-employed. And Then we come to wage theft. PwC estimates that $1.35 billion in wages are stolen or unpaid every year. And Australian Industry Super Australia estimates that as much as $6 billion in superannuation is not paid, affecting one in three Australian workers. Under the inaction of the Morrison government, Australian workers must deal with insecure work, with falling wages and wage theft. Behind these facts and figures are human stories and real workers that have been affected. Workers like Diego. Since coming from Brazil three years ago, Diego has been working for a food delivery, delivery company called Deliveroo, and he was often paid below the minimum wage working almost every day of the week, delivering food to people's doorstops. To support his wife and 11-month-old daughter, Diego has become the face of the heartless way these companies try to employ their workers. In the midst of the global pandemic, at a time of an unprecedented increase in demand for food delivery, delivery sacked Diego with practically no warning, all because he was 10 minutes late with an order. In the midst of a pandemic, with a wife and daughter to support, interviewed in the a on the ABC, Diego spoke of his sacking. And I quote, it was frustrating, as I'd been with them for years and they just didn't care what I had to say. I mentioned all of my personal problems, my loss of income, my, my wife and 11-month-old daughter, who I had to take care of, but they just don't care. And backed by his union, the Transport Workers' Union, Diego has taken Deliveroo to the court over his unfair dismissal. His challenge is a major test case for the gig economy in Australia. Not one this government's funding. When they fund cases against casual workers that get rights in the mining industry 
and back big labour hire companies and they back big miners, of course they intervene in those cases, but they don't intervene in the cases for real people that are really struggling, that deserve to have rights in this economy. Of course, I eagerly await the case. And I certainly won't be holding my breath waiting for the government to act. Because the workers in deferred delivery need outcomes now. A recent survey of riders and drivers by the TWU and the Drivers' Riders Alliance revealed the distressing nature of the industry. An average hourly rate of little more than $10 an hour. Almost two-thirds felt they'd been unfairly treated by a company without a chance to defend themselves. More than a third have been injured on the job, with almost 80 per cent of those injured received no support of any kind from their company. And we know this is dangerous work, and we know that we've had five people that have been killed in a matter of only a few months, and all of them leave behind friends and family, loved ones who deserve better than to lose their father, their brother, son or a friend to an industry that pays critically low rates of pay and incentivises people to work, to drive and ride dangerously just to be able to put food on the table. And of course, when you, we're just you know, having this debate about what should happen with the media and what sort of arrangements we should have. You know, some are calling it the Murdoch, uh, you know, the Murdoch uh, tax. But what others are calling it also is the fact that they're prepared to take up this government a case for Murdoch against Facebook, the gig economy, tech companies, but they're not prepared to take cases up for hard-working people in this country that are literally dying at the hands of these companies, that are being ripped off by these companies. Now, rather than just handing money over to firms in the hope that they'll keep journalism going, and taking on the big tech companies, which you know people pounding their chest in the last few days. How about you pound your chest for Didi Frede, Zhen Chu Chen, Xiao Qi Xin, Bijou Paul, Paul, and Ike Wong, all of which died because they did not have the protections against those same monoliths and the same type of corporations that you failed to take to account. And hearing the uh, Minister Porter in the House yesterday and seeing the responses to questions asked about Deliveroo and saying to give these workers minimum wage, to give them rights to collectively bargain, that those things are just too complicated. This is, this is the Attorney General has responsibility for workplace relations and he says someone getting paid half the minimum wage is too complicated for him and government to work out? Well, it says it all. It's not too complicated. It's just that they've simply taken the side of those Bing monoliths and made a decision. My, my uh, card is always going to be in their card is always going to be in my pocket. It's quite clear that when these companies are supported in these sorts of actions, in lack of action to protect these workers, that people pay the price. And these companies are literally killing people in the food delivery industry. These companies are literally maiming people in the food delivery industry. There has been report after report about what occurs when you incentivise payments for companies and for workers in the way that this, these companies are. When you do not give them a minimum wage, an appropriate wage to be able to sustain their families, that they drive like hell and they put themselves at risk. Because it's a choice between doing that or not eating, doing that or not providing for your daughter or your partner or your family. Now, we clearly need a government that turns around and says that all workers are important, the economy is important, that people have the capacity to spend. That business doing the right thing is more important than business doing the wrong thing. The companies that operate in competition with the gig economy, who operate and pay decent wages, who actually have enterprise bargaining agreements, and it might be surprising to some on the other side that the enterprise bargaining agreements that are with unions are at better rates of pay, 
at better conditions, people have more of a voice. There's more consultation in negotiations for agreements. But that's, too in, that's, that's inconvenient for those on the opposite side to actually recognise that, because that's been the strength of enterprise bargaining agreements. What the weakness is is the fact that there's laws in here that does not allow proper negotiation to take place. And it means the laws that have been proposed by this government will further exasperate the imbalance of bargaining right through the middle of a pandemic. Now, if you wanted any more starker example of where this country uh, is getting it wrong and this government's got it so wrong, and that is when we say to gig workers that they don't count, when we say to their loved ones that they don't count, when we say to those that have lost those in their families that they don't count. When we say that you can be paid less than minimum wage, it's too complicated to fix. You know, I deal with a lot of employers in my previous life, and I tell you what, they don't think that it doesn't count. They think it does count for something, and you should think that way too. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we'll start by, uh, by recognising um, uh, the, the, the merit in Senator Sheldon bringing those complaints to the chamber and the need for those to, to be properly uh, investigated. Uh, uh, people, mis if they are mistreated by, by large companies or small companies, uh, deserve justice. And, and uh, 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 I would note that, that there's been significant change in uh, employment markets or, I suppose, work arrangements with the rise of companies like Deliveroo and Uber and the like. And it's probably not unusual that, therefore, our, our laws might be lagging some of those developments. We should look at those things, and that's why we've got a, an inquiry on at the moment to, to investigate. I'm not so sure that Senator Sheldon himself has the solutions just yet. I know he only had a brief contribution, but I'm not sure he necessarily heard those. It's one thing to say it's simple, and, uh, and it's not as complicated as the minister says, but, but uh, I've been speaking to, to a few uh, Uber drivers, and, uh, and all the main ones we interact with. They don't really, we don't have Deliveroo in Rockhampton. They don't really get that. But uh, um, and and you know, there is actually some of them really do like the flexibility they get. So I'm not so sure they want to go to a regulated, centralised, unionised environment just yet. So I, I will very much through that inquiry make sure that the workers are front and centre of what this parliament should do. Um, but returning to the actual uh, matter of uh, public interest before us here today, um, uh, um, I, I think it's quite an achievement from the Labor Party. I, I believe they've uh, got a motion here of about 19 words I had it at, and they criticised the Morrison government for falling wage growth, uh, for lack of action on, on wage theft, and, uh, and also for uh, increasing the amount of insecure work. And it's quite an achievement in just a 20 odd words the Labor Party have been able to squeeze in three misleading statements and sometimes flat out wrong statements. So, in, in, in the uh, case that the first one of falling wages growth, well, uh, that's just not true. It's just not true. Wages have not been falling. In fact, over the time of the coalition government, uh, uh, real wages, that is, after inflation, uh, nominal wages have gone up even more, but that, that's not a fair comparison. Real wages, when you take out the effects of inflation, have gone up 0.7 per cent a year uh, during the coalition government, and that's actually just, just slightly above the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent a year. So uh, there's definitely not a falling wages. Now, of course, we'd like those wages to be growing higher and, and, and better than they have been. Um, we do have an issue with productivity growth as a nation. That is something that must be focused on, and that's why we want to lower taxes, which have been opposed by the Labor Party. It's why we want, we're, we're, we're providing more tax incentives for capital accumulation uh, through the instant asset write-off changes. They've been very successful, and it's of course why we're reforming the overall industrial relations scheme too. This motion also accuses the coalition government of not acting on wage theft. Now I don't have time. I'm trying to spend a minute, basically. Uh, on each of the Labor Party's misleading, three misleading statements. So I don't have time to go through all of the action that the Commonwealth Government has taken, but I believe we've put aside $160 million uh, towards increased uh, compliance uh, of uh, uh, people engaging in wage theft. We are going to create a new criminal offence for dishonest and systematic underpayments of one or more employees with a maximum penalty of four years. 
will also be increasing civil penalties as well and, and prohibiting employers from advertising jobs with pay rates below the minimum wage. We have seen some shocking examples of underpayments of effectively wage theft in recent times, and in response to those, the Commonwealth Government has and will continue uh, to take action. And finally, um, on the idea that uh, insecure work is increasing, uh, I think Senator Sheldon was quoting that last year somewhere, somewhere around 60 per cent of the jobs were part time. Well, maybe news to Senator Sheldon, we were in a global pandemic. There was a global pandemic going on, and, and it makes sense that in the time of that uncertainty, the global uncertainty, that perhaps there were going to be a lot of companies, a lot of businesses not offering full-time jobs. Uh, because obviously when you offer a full-time job, you're making a commitment over a number of years and you'd want a fairly certain economic environment to make such a commitment. So it's not at all unusual that in times of global uncertainty that of the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years, at least in terms of this health issue of a pandemic, there would be an increase in the proportion of jobs going to part-time. But in good news, the recent Labor force figures, which I don't think Senator Sheldon concentrated on, 60,000 full-time jobs were created in the last month's employment data. 60,000 full-time jobs. That is a massive amount and, and gives us hope for the future. Thank you, Senator Canavan. So the time for this discussion has expired.